This week, this week, Unitarian Universalists will celebrate the 60th anniversary of the consolidation of the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America into the Unitarian Universalist Association. The new faith, Unitarian Universalism, that was created in 1961 was not based on creed, shared set of belief that everybody needed to ascribe to, but rather on covenant, a shared understanding of how we are together and how we show up in the world. And that covenant is best and most commonly expressed through the principles of our association, those principles that our congregations covenant to affirm and promote, those principles which are changing and changeable and a living part of our faith. Back in November, I was asked to submit a column to Quest, our monthly magazine, in which I explained why it was that we say Black Lives Matter and not All Lives Matter when our first principle, in fact, affirms and promotes everyone's inherent worth and dignity. I wrote in part that not all lives, that all lives were not under equal threat of violence in our society. That we say Black Lives Matter to draw attention to the emergency that exists, an emergency that involves the force of the state in the person of police officers devaluing the lives of Black people to the point that they are regularly murdered. I tried to say that the entire system of policing is broken in our nation, and I tried to say that without eliciting the misguided and ignorant response that not all police officers are bad. And a note, any time a systemic critique is met with not all, a red flag should go up in your mind. Not all men, not all white people, not all police officers, and yet, and yet systemic oppression still exists. I tried in my article to point to the large scale and radical changes that will be necessary to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of my black siblings without getting into the weeds of holding individuals accountable for their actions. I tried, I didn't get it exactly right. In response to that article, Clifford, a CLF member incarcerated in Illinois, asked me in a letter to look into the work of political philosopher Hannah Arendt, who wrote extensively about power and accountability from her vantage point as a survivor of the Holocaust in Germany. Specifically, Clifford challenged my assertion that, quote, I do not blame individual officers, unquote, for police violence against Black people. Drawing on Arendt's work, Clifford wrote to me, quote, by not placing blame for particular action or inaction on the individual officers, we not only strip them of the personal responsibility necessary to holding them accountable, we undermine the importance and significance of the actions of those officers brave enough to stand up against the system. The words of Clifford. Hama Arendt, in the essay that Clifford asked me to read, Personal Responsibility Under Dictatorship, writes, where all are guilty, none is. Making the case that it is better to suffer than to do wrong, Arendt says that individuals have a moral obligation not to perpetuate systems of injustice, even when their own lives or livelihoods are at stake. Clifford and Hannah Arendt, of course, are correct. It is vital, even in an unjust system, that the individual perpetrators of acts of injustice be held accountable for their actions. Arendt also notes that politically, those who, choose, who chose the lesser evil forget very quickly that they chose evil. Acceptance of lesser evils, she continues, is consciously used in conditioning the population at large to the acceptance of evil as such. 
This is precisely how systems as violent and unjust as modern policing in the United States have become institutions that most white Americans support and trust. Those of us acculturated to whiteness have been conditioned to accept the evil in our midst. Clifford is also right when he asserts that notions of responsibility and accountability are not limited to extreme cases. Each of us makes moral judgments every day. Each of us makes choices for good or bad every day. Each of us has the option again and again to choose to participate in perpetuating wrong or to oppose it. And each of us should be held accountable when our actions cause harm to others. It is here that we find tensions inherent in the principles of our Unitarian Universalist faith, the principles that Unitarian Universalist congregations covenant to affirm and promote. One such example is the tension between freedom and responsibility. Our fourth principle says, we affirm a free and responsible for search for truth and meaning. Freedom has limits. Elsewhere, the right of conscience promoted in the fifth principle is not always compatible with the justice for all we seek in our sixth. Conscience has limits too. As a covenantal faith, we rely on how we agree to be together to help us decide what to do. And we rely on processes that help bring us back to covenant when we cause harm. Processes of accountability in which we are asked to stop the harm that we are doing, to understand the harm we have done, to make amends for that harm, and finally to agree not to do it again. Within our faith, just as in our society at large, these processes are imperfect, and yet they are how we move forward towards creating better systems. For as many times as we say that our faith is based in covenant, we miss that accountability way too often. Unitarian Universalists and our institutions too often miss the fact that we are called to make reparations when we harm someone, whether that harm is intentional or unintentional. Too often, when the free search for truth and meaning turns irresponsible, harm is done. We see this too often with cultural misappropriation in which people colonize the faith traditions of others, steal their sacred texts and practices and warp them beyond understanding. We read in our hymnals at the very beginning that our faith tradition draws upon wisdom from the world's religions. And those of us who are enculturated to whiteness too often take this as permission to just take things, things that do not belong to us. Too often, too often, when the right of communities to vote is not weighed against our responsibility to the inherent web, excuse me, too often the right of communities to vote is not weighed against our responsibility to the interdependent web of all existence. And when that happens, harm is done. We see this in struggles for environmental justice around the world, from toxic waste dumped in Warren County, North Carolina, to mountains of US generated garbage in China, to rising sea levels caused by increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, threatening the lives and livelihoods of island nations around the world. We see it and we see that our right to vote for policies within our borders causes ripples far beyond them. Too often, when the right of conscience is not tempered with our calls to compassion, justice, and equity, harm is done. We see this again and again in our faith. We see it in too many places to name, and yet there are some that are happening right now that I feel like I need to name. People who insist that their beliefs about vaccines based in disproven pseudoscience and fears are enough to put entire communities at risk because they are deeply held are causing harm. 
Never mind that we share our space with immune compromised people who rely on herd immunity to protect them. Never mind that we share our space with children for whom there is not an approved vaccine yet. Those people are doing harm and that harm needs to be addressed. People who believe outdated and misguided things about gender and sexuality and who use those beliefs to dehumanize and marginalize LGBTQ people are doing harm. People whose notions about what constitutes a woman or a man excludes our transgender siblings, people who dismiss the existence of those of us whose gender exists outside of the binary, these people are doing harm and that harm needs to be addressed. People who insist that race is not a valid social category and thus refuse to engage in developing an accountable analysis of how power is used and abused in our society and our congregations are doing harm. I don't see race, we are told by these people, who then follow that assertion by lifting up only the ideas of 18th century white Europeans and Americans. I note here that our society has evolved and developed since those ideas first came to be, and I invite those stuck in the white supremacy of previous centuries to grow as well, because those people are doing harm, and that harm needs to be addressed. People who repeat ad nauseum reactionary conservative talking points about critical race theory straight from Fox News without any understanding of what critical race theory actually is are doing harm. It is important to understand the deep cultural power of race in our society and those people who are doing harm need to have their harm addressed. Just as in our wider society, the harm that is being done within our faith, within our congregations and in our association at large, that harm is not equally shared by all people. People of color, including black and indigenous people, bear a disproportionate burden of the harm done by people acting out of covenant in our faith. And just as in our wider society, that harm needs to be addressed directly, not with platitudes or misdirection. Which brings us to the proposal to affirm and promote an eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. In our larger institution, the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, this proposal is one of many currently being discussed by an Article II study commission. It will not be something we vote on for some time. We do not know the final form that it will take at our associational level. In fact, this week, the Canadian Unitarian Council adopted their version of this principle, worded slightly differently, but with the same general nugget inside of it. They adopted it just this week. In the meantime, however, while we're waiting for that commission to do its work, while we're waiting to see how we change things on our associational level, the emergency of spiritual harm still exists. And so we, as a congregation, are being asked to affirm and promote this principle in our work. The eighth principle reads, we covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse multicultural beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. That is the proposed language that we are being asked to affirm and promote even as the larger association discusses and wordsmiths and changes and incorporates in different ideas and feedback. We are asking the members of the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Larger Fellowship to recognize the emergency in our midst. The emergency of racism and oppression the emergency of harm being done disproportionately to people whose identities are marginalized by systems of oppression 
in our society. We are asking all of us to engage in accountably dismantling racism and other oppressions and to hold our congregations, especially this congregation, accountable for this work. Hannah Arendt would remind us that if this is simply an institutional responsibility, it is in fact no one's. So yes, this is all of our individual work too. We are asking each and every one of us to pay attention, to call people back into covenant when they do harm, to name that harm as harm and to call people back into covenant and to be open to repairing relationships when we are the ones who are doing the harm. We are asking each and every one of us to temper our freedom with responsibility, to temper our democratic process with a dedication to justice, equity, and compassion, to counter our individualism with interdependence. This is our call. A culture of accountability starts here. It is past time that our Unitarian Universalist movement embraced accountability as a vital part of our covenantal union this week, 60 years old. May it be so now. Amen.